Ah, <laughs> making a video. Sorry. Uh, it happens. Anyway, so I thought I would do a response video to this, well, this torn Thornhill. Long path to understanding gravity. So he's one of these um, electric universe kind of people. There's this Thunderbolts project. Somehow he's connected to this idea. Kind of Teslian, I guess, or something. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just trying to provoke conversation with even some of those people. Um, the only person commenting on my videos is the, the real crazy ones. Um, yeah, who, I guess he deleted this comment. I don't know. He's made some sort of, um, whatever his name is, the truth something, truth quest or whatever. And he's got that whole religious Bible thing, the rewritten Bible that has physics in it. Everything's just a tornado, you see. It's all this. But there's a lot of people doing that. You know, a lot of people doing this. Everything's tornadoing. You know, there's, there's vortices. Is, and, yeah, it's all different. <laughs> yeah. It's, it sort of looks like that, even in Einstein's gravity. You know, you just throw something in there and it spins down. But that's just a consequence of the reality, not a part of. It's not the mechanism. It's, you know. Uh, so, I mean, even galaxies, I guess, you know, they kind of do that a little bit. Um, but, yeah, like I said, it's a consequence. It's not a, it's not the function. So, uh, these people have these, so, you know, I played the first 16 minutes or 17 minutes or whatever, and it doesn't say much. I mean, good speaker, and, um, pointing out how, you know, physics doesn't really give answers to questions. It just sits there and gives you a mathematical equation, which is just a relationship. So let's understand, like, D equals MC squared. It's just pointing out a relationship that, <clears throat> you know, mass is pretty much full of energy. And that energy can be in the form of mass. It can be stored there. It's like a battery. Um... But it's just forming a relationship, and, and there's just relationships as part of the equation. So when you expand a relationship, say, you know, uh, the gravitational constant times the mass times the mass divided by the hmm, density squared? No, radius squared. It's got to be something like that. Um, R squared, even though it says D squared there. That's by my vision. Anyway, um, I guess distance, that is, D. I don't know. Anyway, um, it's just, these are just partly acknowledging things have to add up or, con you know, there's components to everything's function. And you're just saying, you know, by creating these symbols and these letters, you're just saying these are symbols and letters for different kinds of things that things have. We have acceleration, we have velocity, um, you know, we, we have these things. There's components of us that are accelerating. There's the components of us that have velocity. There's movement and stuff happening inside of us, um, you know, that create things like charge and all this other stuff. And we can measure those things and we say this pile of thing, when you take into account all the little different things it's doing, this is what its net do is, or this is what its net potential to do is. And uh, so, you know, I don't know if I want to, uh, you know, look, I'm, I'm proposing this, this, see, the sympathy, when you talk about, the, the guy even says in the comments, when you talk about gravity, you end up talking about things like inertia. You have to sort of explain inertia if you're going to be able to explain gravity. And to explain inertia is to understand that when something has velocity, the character of the thing that has velocity is what has changed. It's not traveling some some corridor in space. It's not the space around it, as Einstein, Einstein's theory would essentially... I, well, I don't even know if it does really do that, frankly. Uh, I mean, it would account for acceleration by saying it's a space is bent before you and that accelerates you. You know, if there's a trough you're falling into, you know. Um, and that's why you accelerate, but it doesn't really explain why you keep moving. You know, even Einstein's description of, as this guy points out, Einstein's description of curved space, when drawn in two dimensions, needs gravity to work. 
So here you have an explanation of gravity. The space goes down. And frankly, that description doesn't work if you don't put it in a gravitational orientation. So it has no, it has no, it has, there's no capacity to draw it in three dimensions. There's no capacity to understand it as a three-dimensional um, mechanism. And it certainly is a three-dimensional mechanism. And obviously we often take the shortcut of a two-dimensional model just because three dimensions just make it that much more complicated. But they're all the same dimensions. There's three dimensions, up, down, forward, back, left, right. That's it. There's just, that's it. Those circles make the complete circle. <laughs> you know, those lines, um, that, that, that um, infrastructure creates your everything you need, uh, uh, the components of the universe. Something has to be in one of those <coughs> fields. Pie hunks, uh, wedges, whatever, however you want to describe it. Um, and that's sort of how it can be understood, it's wedges of, of placement. Um, and as, you know, and if your vector is in one of those, then you have a net vector, a net acceleration that is a combination of all three, where you're moving in all three dimensions. So anyway, um, so yeah, and so inertia is, the idea is that they're just a collection of these little BBs. The universe has them randomized, essentially. So there's, say, in the, in the, initial, in the initial condition, or in the, the plainest condition, they have no net direction. They're just, there's just as many going this way as there are this way as there are that way as there are that way as there are that way as there are this way. So in every dimension, they're equal. And it wouldn't really matter if they're unequal in some dimension because you wouldn't be able to notice it. But the point is, is the idea is, is that you start with this inertial frame of <coughs> equal and that your condition is in net that you possess a certain amount of these BBs and if you have a velocity in a direction it means you have more of these little bits that are moving in that direction than you have moving in the opposite direction. So that's the key to this dimension thing. The dimension always has a forward and a back, a left and a right, which can be looked at as a forward and a back, and an up and a down, which can be looked at as a forward and a backward. You know, they're all inverse directions vectors, um, exactly opposite. All right. Um, so you can have an imbalance in up versus down or left versus right. And that imbalance will be revealed in the sense that what you're made out of will tend to migrate in that direction. The school of fish that is you will have more right fish than left fish, then you're going to go right. It's just going to happen uh, over time. Um, and that's inertia. Inertia is a change in your condition. You've collected fish that are going right. That's what you did. If you go right, well, it's because you collected fish that go right. Um, so we filter out of the mass um, our identity um, as a moving thing uh, based on a net disposition of our collected mass, and that's what mass is. So anyway, so from, from there you can maybe understand why, what my critique will be of this description. So his, there's a couple of things he says here. Okay, we understand gravity, we must understand why matter has mass. Uh, physicists have no answer. Well, I think, they, I think some physicists do, but clearly mass is just... <coughs> Is, is just a collection, uh, an amount, of that field, that field of BBs, and you have a collection of them. And important to the idea of mass is the idea that they are in relationships to each other. That means they're trapped, essentially, in a kind of way. So they're, they're more compact, meaning they're closer together, so the BBs are closer together, and that they have a a relationship in the sense that they are close enough to each other that they maintain connection to each other. 
That is, if something happens to one of them, it happens to the other one because the pressure that they impose on each other is changed. So if there's something in front of me and there's a field of straight line pressure on both of us, I won't receive the straight line pressure that's coming from behind the other person and he won't receive the straight line pressure that's coming from behind me and there'll be a lack of pressure between us and that can be understood. If there's no way for the pressure to go around the corner, if it's all has to be straight lines, you know, can understand that there will be an absence of light, so to speak, a shadow created. I shadow him, he will shadow me. Um, and <clears throat> that relationship now ties us together in the sense that that shadow, if we understand that acceleration is created by imbalances in the field I'm in, so if I'm in a field where there's more pressure behind me and less pressure in front of me, I will tend to be pushed in the direction of the less pressure, um, <clears throat> and I will gain acceleration, and coincidental to the function of gravity, or incidental, or fundamental to the function of gravity, as I accelerate, I will be, in fact, absorbing more of those arrows. So if I was, say if I had arrows pointing me forward, <coughs> and I had an absence of arrows coming from behind, I mean, I had an excess of them from behind me. I would be gaining, my, my, as my character changes, I do something called accelerating in a direction. It just means that now my, the, the structure I am in, as I gain something called velocity, will be that I'll have more of those arrows. So as they pass through me, some of them will stick. And of that extra pressure they will replace some arrow going some other way. So I will release something going some other way at some point in time as I collect something going this way. I'll end up with the same amount of mass. It's just that I'm going to convert. I'm going to exchange a piece of mass that was going that way with a piece of mass going that way. Or more directly, I'll exchange a piece of mass going this way with a piece of mass going that way. Uh, to make it all more efficient. Um, so, yeah, so your mass is just the fact that you are a collection of this, like I said, the field is full of this stuff. It's just that you don't recognize it because it's not consolidated, it's not dense. So there's no relationship tying it together. So if you block one, it doesn't change how all the others behave. It just ends up being a straight line vector kind of a thing. It doesn't have any... Uh, resonance, where we have that resonance, we have that collected effect. You can't tap one piece of us without it bouncing through all the pieces of us because of that relationship, <laughs> that pressure relationship that creates tension. See, tension is a key word. Um, it doesn't sound like physics, it sounds more like a mechanical word. You know, mechanics seems a little far from physics, but tension is the key to the transmission. Tension is the key to um, communicating between one thing and another thing, is to create this tension. But anyway, I don't want to confuse things by adding extra words or extra concepts. Anyway, just to understand the difference between empty space, that's actually full of energy and full of matter, I mean full of potential matter, and us, is just that consolidation thing. We're just more compactly, we have more BBs per square inch, which, <laughs> and because they're more BBs per square inch, they communicate with each other kinetically, directly, instantaneously, not instantaneously, at the speed of light. So anyway, uh, no reference to time um, instantaneous, which contradicts Einstein's speed limit for information. I don't know exactly what he meant by that statement, but he does, he's supporting the idea that there really is instantaneous communication. So the moon and the earth are instantaneously ha acquiring knowledge of each other's mass and creating the necessary gravity somehow out of that knowledge. And I would argue that no, it's, it's not like that. And, and people with this electrical theory should kind of understand what 
um, in that that electricity and magnetism have to be induced that there is a a time delay in the creation of magnetic fields and the migration of electricity and all these things do have very they, they move slower than the speed of light not faster if anything um, and there's no evidence of anything instantaneously happening lightning doesn't instantaneously arrive at earth nothing inst you know there's just no evidence of it so I don't want know why they presuppose the existence of it um, clearly um, Einstein doesn't have to worry about time in some in some calculations time is going to be irrelevant um, and in some calculations it's going to be entirely relevant but when you're doing the big picture in and out thing you really don't care about time you're just saying don't be too little I mean don't don't impose too little a time standard but the equation works fine as long as you're talking about over the period of five seconds or something then yeah the math will always work yes if you abbreviate to some shorter pe period of time things might break down but time isn't critical because it's a net equation for a net process not for the interior of the process not for the mechan not for the individual steps of the process it's an equation describing the outcome of the process okay big g um, big g is the gravitational constant has a particular dimension of length mass and time I don't, it's 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 just used to uh, it's, you know all constants are essentially just limiters right they're they're there to create some kind of backup plan in case your equation reduces to zero or to keep it within you know to, to create some sort of um, um, scale so you can call it a Kelvin or something and you couldn't call it a Kelvin if you didn't have a scale that kind of thing all right mass is an energetic variable okay so this is this is where you know it's it's almost correct but not quite mass is an energetic variable so g cannot be constant or universal so mass is when you have a mass it's full of these little bb's yes the quanta is energetic but mass is not energetic so you know that's where that fails is there's no energy in there, no, wrong word to use. There's no expression except in the quanta, in the, the bits that make up the mass. And the mass doesn't vary. So, I mean, once you've acquired um, your BBs, your mass will stay the same unless you're acquiring mass, unless you acquire new BBs. So there's no variability in your mass unless you're, the field is imposing a force or something else is happening where you're going to end up converting, where you're going to store more energy. So you could be hit by sunlight and your chemistry and, and, and the physics of your molecular structure could actually do some photosynthesis. It could actually turn some of that the sunlight into um, material mass in the sense that your electrons could gain energy levels and all that kind of stuff so you could store some of it like a battery not a good battery but a battery you'll store some of that and you'll gain some mass so our mass is only variable in the sense that the field around us has to impose a fluctuation so we have to be hit by some imbalance in the field and light is a good example of usually is an imbalance I mean, when a star shines, there's not a star on the opposite side of the universe shining at exactly the same time. So you can sort of understand that photons of light, which are just the same as these pieces of gravity, they're the same BBs, they're just coming at a frequency, a steady frequency. But they're obviously eradicates, they're, they're obviously imbalances in the field, because they obviously only have, the, they have a one directional source. So, so they're obviously going to be, they're obviously going to create imbalance in the things they interact with because there's not going to be some obvious constituent photon coming from the opposite direction. So they're kind of an add-on in terms of directionality. They're, an, they're evidence of a filter. There's been energy from other directions sucked into a star is now being released in one direction towards you or something like that. It's not as obvious as that because the sun basically pulls stuff in and then releases it 
all in the same direction, you know, equally. Um, but the point is, is there's directional change that has taken place in that area of space, and that change, the imbalance in that area of space, is now in your area of space, maybe a billion years later. But that imbalance is still exists there. The, 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 that field, the field around that sun, is now minus one BB moving this way so to speak. Um, but it's also minus a lot of others. So if it's lost just as much in the other directions, then there's no imbalance in that field. But you can get the idea how imbalance can be created by merely reflecting light or doing something else to take the imbalance and send it someplace else. And now there'll be, you know, twice as much going some direction. Uh, not the most articulate way to say it. Let's finish this lovely cigarette. Mm. Ah, <laughs> yeah, they really. It's been a nice few days. Cigarettes, yeah, it's a holiday pleasure. That's what we'll call it. Um, hmm. It's so nice. Um, so, yeah, I'll play some of this. I mean, I stopped at this point. I'll play a little bit and then I'll see whether I need to stop and come back and do whatever but this uh, yeah I, I say my argument here with these people is that it's just you know unfortunately they're betting on the wrong horse um, electricity isn't even really a thing I mean electricity is a description of the movement of quanta through usually material objects so they're being transferred by electrons or something else they're they're migrating through a pathway created for them by the structure of matter and um, they're just a kind of gravity moving through being being channeled through a mechanism and um, and the polarization is this is the same as the polarization of light except this expression of polarization and gravity creates this phenomenon of electricity and magnetism um, so, I, you know, I don't know, I will, probably won't get into that, but um, it's, it's that simple. But so they're betting on the wrong force. The, the fundamental force is in electricity. The fundamental force is gravity, or this idea of this field of bits. And so you have to go there first. I mean, the gravity is the first force in the sense that it's essentially the only force. It is the movement of quanta that is everything. And all you're talking about is imbalances in the distribution of quanta moving in a particular de 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 direction. So it's just, again, just collecting um, out of a field of randomness, out of, out of a field of, I mean, I hate to use that word, um, but I just mean to imply a, a balanced field. And then through, because there's, there's something in, you know, left over, some residue, that stuff can hit um, after a big bang or something. Um, there's a collection, a clogging, and once you clog in one area, the clog will tend to expand, and that will steal. It will it will absorb these BBs out of the field. So it says, so like you know, I thought of the, the, an argument for inertia. It's like with your velocity. Your velocity changes not only when some other force acts against you, like you could just say gravity, you know, the, the little bits that are coming down because they're being, you're getting more of them because the sun is blocking a bunch, but more importantly, the earth below you is blocking a bunch of the arrows coming up. And so you're getting a bunch more from down, so you're getting a higher density of down arrows. And if you have velocity up, um, you're fighting that force. <clears throat> but in other examples, like a like a plane flying through an atmosphere, the force that's blocking it or taking away or depriving it of velocity that will cause it to lose velocity in a lateral direction and gain velocity going down because of gravity. But the one that the the the, the friction that's the one stopping it from moving. The force isn't because another force is coming at you. The force is that you're giving away your velocity as you hit these little things in front of you, as you hit these other bits of matter, 
you're giving them acceleration. And for them to accelerate, you have to give them extra arrows. And so you're, you're giving away your velocity to the other matter. And so it's not like there's some opposing force. It's that you've given away your identity, your velocity. And that's how you stop. That's what stops you, is that you just keep giving away your arrows going in the direction you're going. So, you know, if you're going this way and you hit stuff that you make it go that way, you've given away your arrows, and now you have less of those velocity arrows. You have less imbalance. It's that simple. It really is. I mean, and when you give them away, you're essentially exchanging. So when you give them a forward arrow, they'll likely give you the Newtonian inverse reaction backward arrow. And so your balance, you'll just keep losing. If they were colored jelly beans, you know, and red meant forward and blue meant backward, you're just basically giving them your reds and they're giving you blues and that's why you lose inertia and velocity. All right, I'll play some of this. That means that big G, which we measure on Earth, is neither universal nor a constant. And in fact, it's the, um, the worst defined constant in physics. Every time it's measured, it's different. And even using the same equipment, it varies. So what I would suggest is there is more complexity in the effects attributed to gravity. I say attributed because in some cases we're looking at actual electromagnetic force. All right, so these are kind of these, they always do this with dinosaurs, you know, they say it's too big, its neck is too long, it would break, it was, you know, I mean, it's kind of obvious though that it did it, so it was probably a mechanism or a reason why it did it, and I thought the explanation that these were more grazing animals than the tall tree kind of thing sort of made some sense. So they're not really made like giraffes, I mean, they're made a little bit like they could tilt, you know, their whole body. But I think their necks were pretty rigid, and that you know they did just go side to side a lot, and it, so it's a, it wasn't a flexible neck you know, like we have. So it, you know it could take a lot more weight. But they obviously did have little tiny heads, you know, so they weren't carrying much weight on the end of that long. But anyway, in this whole thing, the pterodactyls couldn't fly because of blah blah blah. But they did. <laughs> it's just, just no point in, you know. No point in wasting time saying they didn't. And who knows how well they flew, right? Flying squirrels fly. And you say, shit, okay, if somebody thought they were flapping their wings and flying, well, yeah, that's stupid because they're gliding. So t pterodactyls were probably just doing a lot of, you know, that thermal thing. They probably hit the thermals and they were doing a lot of hang gliding. But they probably weren't very good flyers. All right, but anyway. There is more complexity in the effects attributed to gravity than any equation yet devised can explain. Uh, I don't know exactly what that means, but yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't know what some of those some of these little burb blurbs aren't very useful because they're not really straightforward. I should get my big G straight. Like I said, I thought big G was the gravitational constant. So, but no, whatever. Well, so talk about that. That's mistaken for gravity. Uh, you know, I don't think, like I said, the constant to me is sort of irrelevant to the man. I, I, I think it was invented, like I said, pretty much for the purpose of keeping the universe static. And, you know, that it had lots of, it has lots of uses in the math, but I don't think it has any uses in theoretical physics. I don't think theoretically to understand what's happening in the universe, you need any constants at all, technically. There, what you're looking for is the is the mechanism, the thing that's doing something, not the thing that's not doing something. And a constant is kind of implying a nothing. The complex it has more complexity than any equation yet devised can explain. It depends on the context whether it's actually valid or not. It's not universal. We repeated the mistake of Earth centrism. In other words, we measure G on Earth and then apply it throughout the universe. What gave us the right to do that? 
Okay, so that's a, a kind of a bold claim, right? We, we repeat the mistake of earth centrism and we have selective blindness towards conflating evidence. Um, but this whole idea that, look, I, I'm certainly arguing that it's possible at the ends of the universe, gravity dissipates and disappears and everything just falls apart. But we kind of know just from function that, you know, that the, uh, the fundamental equation, this inverse square rule, is sound. And we certainly can understand that the elements have a mass, and that mass has a shadowing power. And all those rules are the same, and so I don't, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what evidence they're using to pick on the idea that, you know, the, the, the function of gravity in a, some other solar system in this galaxy is different than the function of gravity in this solar system, or that this, our galaxy is functioning under some different rules of gravity than, the, than a galaxy Five billion light years away. I just don't. You know, where do you where do you have any evidence of that? They are shaped similarly. They they move similarly. The evidence is that gravity's basically pretty consistent, and we certainly you know when where it starts to lose meaning is when you start looking way back in time by looking at things very far away. See, we can't see things very far away today. Like the stuff that's very far away today, <laughs> you know. We have no hope of seeing, all right? I mean, it's billions of light years away, and it's making light today. You get it? And the light's not going to get here for 15 billion, 20 billion years. We, we're not going to see anything that's out there now. We're just seeing what's what was there in, at some time that we consider to be near the, the Big Bang. But I'm saying I, I don't even think that's what it is. I mean, if it's 15 billion years out there and we're seeing it, it took a long time for it to get there because it didn't move faster than the speed of light to get there. So if we say the universe is 15 billion years old and we've seen the light from something 15 billion years old, then you can say right from that, if it doesn't look like a big bang, if it doesn't look like it's in a place all, all coming from the same place, then clearly it's way out there when we're seeing it, which means the universe has got to be much older than where we're seeing the first light from but that you know it's just deduction so we have selective blindness towards conflicting evidence and we invent dark matter and dark energy and all this stuff well again I, I would agree that I think those contrivances and that's what they are they're pretty much just contrivances they just invented them for the purpose of making things to add up to, to force mass where they can't find mass to explain phenomenon that they can't explain by the, the proven theories they say they have. They say they have these proven, reliable, it always comes out, it always works out. Well, it always works out because you always come up with something like dark matter or dark energy or some other bullshit to make it work because obviously it doesn't work without it. I mean, the most proven theory in the history of mankind. You know, yeah, because we put Tabasco sauce on it. And for example, these pictures that I've got here, and as Anna said in her talk, we ignore the fossil record of impossibly huge creatures. The ultrasaur, in today's terms, would have weighed 180 tons. And the maximum force exerted by any muscle is independent of body size and is the same for the mouse as the elephant. In the antediluvian world... <clears throat> well, I don't think any of that's true. There's clearly... I, I don't know what... I, I, I guess I'm not understanding what he just tried to imply, but there's absolutely no... The mouse and the uh, elephant are living in very different um, st stress points. Elephants are kind of pushing the theoretical envelope. <laughs> They're really vulnerable because there's a hell of a lot of stress on their bones. They're pushing it. And mice are the other way around. Well, 350 pound flying creatures soared in skies which no longer permit flying creatures above 30 pounds or so. And the ultrasaur's neck in today's gravity would have caused a 430,000 foot pound torque where it attached to the body. Even a steel girder of the same mass as that neck would have sagged under that weight. 
<clears throat> yeah, I'm just saying that, you know, biology finds a way, quoting the movie, right? And so um, sagging is the least of its concern, right? A little bit of a sag in my neck wouldn't bother me too much. So maybe this image just isn't correct. Maybe his neck did sag and then it curled up here at the end. I mean, you know, the fact that you want to make it look, you know, they want, they want to make it look strong. Well, they can go ahead and do that. But maybe it wasn't. And again, once... Once you've established this capacity of rigidity in this, like I said, all you all you really need is a tipping point, and you just tip the organism this way. And so, if you don't use the neck as the <coughs> lever, you don't have to have any muscle control over the neck, and you just use the body. You can certainly lever that thing further out. So, I mean, if you're going to assume flexibility, then you have a problem. But if you assume rigidity then the math gets better. Also, we know, observationally, that spacecraft show anomalies in Earth flybys, and comets exhibit what's called non-gravitational forces. That's what makes them difficult to predict their returns. I, I don't know anything about that. Um, non-gravitational forces. Certainly, they, they have explosive problems. I mean, comets are volatile, so obviously if you take a comet and you run it near the sun, it's not just gravity that's going to be relevant anymore, because the comet itself, on one side, is going to be emitting a huge amount of gas, and on the other side, it's going to be just sitting there saying, I'm, I'm fine. Um, and, you know, that's certainly going to have a non-gravitational effect. I mean, strictly speaking, a traditional gravity. And people who have measured gravity or the change in gravity as you go down mine, deep mine shafts and so on actually said it looks like there's a fifth force. It's not changing the way we expect from Newton's law. And people who have measured gravity going up towers have said maybe there's a sixth force because that doesn't conform to Newton's law either. Well, maybe. This is a lot of maybe stuff here. So I, I don't know what, again, what you're measuring. I mean, the trick with, the trick with going down tunnels is that you're taking your atmosphere with you uh, and now you've got a buoyancy issue and so that kind of you, you have to recognize that we're, we're floating in an atmosphere and just as it changes Newton's strict gravity I mean just as uh, quite obviously right the leaning tower of Pisa I throw a bowling ball and a feather off the, the leaning tower the bowling ball gets to the ground real quick and the feather could take days it could end up in you know, Mongolia. So, yeah, it's going to be affected by the atmosphere it's in. So, I'm just saying, I think if you have a mine shaft that's a vacuum, um, you take the atmosphere out of it and the, the buoyancy issues created by the atmosphere, um, and the same with the tower, um, you, you create the same air pressure at the top of the tower that you have on the ground. I don't think you'll find any fluctuations in gravity. I mean anything outside of Newton's predictions of inverse square. It was pointed out to me uh, a few months ago that if you calculate using Newton's law the force of the sun on the moon and the force of the earth on the moon, when the moon is between the earth and the sun, that new moon, the sun is pulling on the moon twice as strongly as the earth. And the question is, well, why, how do we have the moon? question well because pull is a, the tricky word you just used right I, I mean it doesn't pull it's a pushing force you have to think of it as a pressure force so when the earth is be, is behind the moon the moon's going to be gravitationally locked to the earth all right so then even though the earth is blocking is blocking force as far as the moon is concerned in just that direction so there's not some sort of additive effect the, the sun's gravity is consistent. The sun makes its gravity. It blocks. It creates a shadow. Everything else creates another shadow. And you can't just add the shadows up because there are shadows in different directions. The, the gravity imposed on the moon from the earth is an opposite gravity to the direction of the gravity that's being imposed by the sun. So they don't add up. And that's why the, you know, the moon's... Um, vexed <laughs> or whatever
none of these questions are answered by Newton's simple equation. Well, they, they would be if you, if you counterbalance the question. If you just merely say in Newton's equation the premise is, okay, that the alignments are constructive, not destructive. So as long as you say that the alignments are you know, all going in one direction, there's nothing wrong with Newton's adding the masses. But you can't add the masses if the masses are, if, if 3 is in between 2 and 1, it's not going to work. It has to be 1, 2, 3. Um, so that's the only rule. The rule is you can't, you can't use gravities that have directional vectors in conflict. They, all the gravity vectors have to be in the same direction with the two things on the two sides, essentially. The thing being affected by gravity and the thing affecting the gravity, those two things have to have the same gravitational vectors. The two things on the two sides of the equation have to have the same directional vector. I, I mean exactly complementary. One has to have the that direction one has to have the opposite direction. They have to, they have to be exclusive, and in opposite directions. Otherwise, the equation's fine. Of course, if big G is universal, if we use G measured on Earth's surface, the comet 67P looks like solid rock, while its density appears to be that of highly porous dust and ice. And I have repeatedly in the Space News on the Thunderbolts website pointed this out. The planet Saturn appears... Well, well, the appearance of something, I mean, what it looks like on the outside don't have much to do with what it is on the inside, so frankly, you know, you can add up to having a mass because your interior is uranium or something. You know, your exterior could be helium and your interior is uranium, then you could look like you weigh as much as a, you know, a brick when, you know, on the outside, you look like you're peanut butter or marshmallow. But anyway, I'll, I'll come back to this, um, right? I'll play one more little section. Is to have a lower density than water. It could float in water according to using big G as we measure it on Earth. That's okay, I don't know exactly what that is, so is there um, comments? Let's see. The planet Saturn appears to have a lower density than water. Again, this appearance, you have to go by the net value of, of the planet. So there's just no point in talking about what it looks like on the exterior. Because the thing that's going to matter is what it is in net. And so what is the, what, when you add them all up and you divide by the surface, I mean the, the, the collected area, um, that's all that matters. The net, the average mass, not any particular area of mass. Um, so and the sun is calculated to be mostly hydrogen right down to the very core. Why not? Uh, I'll see what he says about that. And the composition of the sun is calculated to be mostly hydrogen right down to the very core. Now what body the size of the sun would have hydrogen gas in its core? Well, you say hydrogen gas, so right there, trouble. Um, it's under sufficient pressure to be probably liquid or some other form, <laughs> okay, of hydrogen. It's not gaseous hydrogen as you know it here. It's, it's so regardless of the idea that we associate um, f freezing things, um, you know, gases having to be very cold to be liquid, what all they really have to be is under pressure. So the fact that this is a very dense, um, gravitational body means that the the stuff on this the, the stuff is being accelerated constantly and besides that acceleration taking place it's stirring it the the weight I, I, you know each bit of this stuff can't can't fulfill its gravitational destiny all this stuff is suppressed from moving where it wants to move so all the stuff that's not the center, anything, anything away from the center is going to feel more gravity as you go further out. And the most gravity is right here on the exterior. So that's the irony of gravity, or the, the trick of it, is that the highest gravity is on the very e outside edge here of the, of the density. So where the density is the highest, you know, there's, this, there's a line somewhere 
you know, right here near the surface, that that's the highest gravity this body creates. And so you can just imagine the highest gravity has the highest pressure because the stuff has acceleration that it can't realize. We're pushing down on, on the interior of the earth, right? You're, you're sitting on your chair. No, you're sitting on the center of the earth. You're squashing everything below you. The chair goes through the, the floor. The floor goes into the ground. The ground goes into the substrate. You're pushing everything going towards the center of the earth. You're pushing on it. So the entire mass of the earth essentially is pushing on that stuff in the very center. So there's no, you know, in spite of the fact that there's no gravity in the center of the earth, there's a ton of chemical pressure Okay, so we're back to this buoyancy idea. The matter itself is pushing. And it's just the fact that matter has a, a tendency to create shields, you know, skins, um, that they don't just push together. You just, can't, you just can't push peanut butter into a steel bar. You can't just say, oh, here's some peanut butter. I'll just push it into the steel. You can't because the steel has a surface. It has a... It has a resistance um, to acquiring less or more density. It has a, it's locked hard in its relationships. The little BBs are relating to each other strongly, and it's, you just can't push new BBs in. You have to push them in, in a particular kind of way to get them in. And so it's that pressure um, that probably has the center of the sun quite dense with hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, solid hydrogen. What the hell do I know? <laughs> Probably liquid though. Certainly not wide spaced gas molecules. They're highly compressed gas molecules. And they might act like a liquid, but they're probably technically a gas, but they're being forced to behave like a liquid. It's like the opposite of a super cooled superconductor. It's like a superheated plasma. That's probably a good point. Anyway, we'll we'll pass. <laughs> we'll leave, we'll leave on that point, and I'll play some and listen and take some notes, maybe, and see if what else we need to cover. Well, that's the only way to do this, right? I mean, I can't do, <laughs> I can't play an hour-long video. It was on it with a four-hour response. So anyway, I'll be back. Ah, huh, I have returned. Hmm. So I watched, uh, I think, all of it. So anyway, I'm going to end up going back and <laughs> playing it, um, so I might make a second video, just because there's a lot of points to be raised, and it's, it's these people, it's just kind of funny how they're, they're so close to getting it right, and, you know, it's just this, you know, once you dismiss, what's an idea or a concept, you don't really have an analogy for it, but there's probably an analogy, you know, you get a, you get an idea of what something is, and then you just can't get free of that idea. You dismiss something and it's just dismissed for all varieties for all time and you can't even say the word anymore. So I know there's lots of things like that. I could use this example but um, I don't have one off the top of my head. <laughs> but anyway it doesn't really matter. It's not really the psychology of it that I want to get to but um, it's just so um, um, you know, I, the point is, it's just so, all they, you know, they just got stuck on this, I love electricity thing, and just didn't realize that, you know, it's just the wrong starting point. Um, so the key point, I would argue, is, is that, you know, this whole thing they're saying is, um, you know, this electric universe, they're talking as if they, they're explaining something. But they're leaving a huge hole in the sense they're just saying there's this attractive force, this charge. And they don't account for how it functions. They just say this charged particle moves towards this charged particle. Period. They're attracted. No explanation. No, no statement about mechanism. Just is. Where if they would have you know, taken stuff that was started 300 years ago, let's say age gravity, and just made that a kinetic force rather than a a force made of. So the funny thing is, they think of it like it's you know they think of particle. Um, um, what do you call it? Particles in this in a physical 
in our physical world rather than in a nuclear world where it would be kinetic and they don't really understand that heat isn't a byproduct it's made of this very substance but anyway um, you know I mean even the sage use the word ultra ultra mundane particles as a way of kind of imp you know stating these are small uh, you know you can't you know they're so invisible um, but um, that's only from perception and in mass they they're everything uh, the other important thing I wanted to say was um, getting back to again how it's almost we're looking at it backwards um, the place we see energy is kind of where there isn't energy ironically I mean the energy is in the universe the energy is full of these little bits bouncing around and as long as that energy is balanced you don't see it there's no effect and there's only effect when you break it when somehow you shadow it you you have an absence of it then it reveals itself so it's like the void is where the action is because the void has to be filled so if you push the energy out of the way if you put push the field away you push the somehow remove it um, imbalance it um, that's when you'll see it and what you're really seeing though isn't really an imbalance in the field you're just seeing an imbalance in the um, makeup of the field in the sense that whether the you know the key will be polarization so whether it's this way or this way and um, whether it comes at a frequency and these are the key things to what we see as energy um, it's just a form of the migration the movement of this field um, but it's all something real has to move for something to move something real moves and it moves into something else and causes it to move there's no there's no invisible force beyond the initial force which is just the idea of this little bit photons graviton quanton moving at the speed of light in a straight line you start with that and you just make a whole lot of it and you have a universe okay so um well yeah we'll do this little faraday part um the long, the long and constant persuasion that all the forces of nature are mutually dependent, having one common origin rather than being different manifestations of one fundamental power, has often made me think on the possibility of establishing by experiment a connection between gravity and electricity. Um, no term could exaggerate the value of the relation they would establish. Uh, well, obviously, we... we, we the value is diminished. I think, you know, even though Einstein's statement of E equals MC squared doesn't unify anything necessarily, it pretty much breaks, it pretty much does what they didn't say at this time. So what was missing here was an understanding that matter is effectively, and I would say quite literally, energy. And it's just trapped energy. It's a battery. Matter is a is a place where uh, <laughs> you know form of energy is all it's doing it's just holding a form of energy <sighs> close enough stations of one fundamental power once again the electric universe uh, idea has often made me think on the possibility of establishing no, by experiment a connection between <laughs> yeah, gravity and electricity. Yeah, and he went on to say, no terms could exaggerate the value of the relation they would establish precisely. Now, if people had followed Faraday's intuition, we would be several centuries advanced, I would say. <clears throat> yeah, I really don't think so, just because most of the... I, I don't think theoretical physics does much to advance anything. I think it's real practical, hands-on stuff. And theory doesn't lead to anything. Realistically, you get a, you get an idea that something's possible, 
and then you play with it and you make the possibility into a reality and I think that's how most of it happens so I don't think theoretical diagrams are necessary anyway but beyond that besides that um, whether we'd be advanced or not the point is is I would say the same thing to this guy to Wallace um, that you know if you paid more attention to Lesage gravity he's going to mention it in this video and he just dismisses it with the same dismissal that people he criticizes like Richard Feynman or somebody else um, you know he dismisses it with the same casualty that you know as if there's nothing to this idea um, and then he cites another guy citing the sage gravity which is ironic as being something that's more viable um, with, and more consistent with cosmological observations so there's a duplicity there in the sense that he's he's dismissing something he's saying this guy's got something right when he's arguing in defense of it so I mean that doesn't even make any sense but anyway but I mean you had the, you, you had the pieces and um, you wasted them um, because you know I, it's through this because stuff I mean really it shouldn't have taken me <laughs> you know it should, really I, I shouldn't be the one who did this it should be somebody better than me should have figured this out it just should be now science But of course this poses the key question. The electric force is both attractive between opposite charges and... <clears throat> okay, but this poses the key question. Why is gravity only attractive? So, so again, it's not attractive. It's a push. So it is all push. And obviously push looks like attraction when you're inside the push, when you're on the wrong side of the shadow, um, when you're on the wrong side of the um, reduced pressure. And repulsive between similar charges, but gravity seems to only attract. Why is that so? <clears throat> uh, right, but it's not really what it does. It, I mean, repulsion is just actually the reversal of the pressure. So the argument's pretty simple in the sense that you know, I'll, I, I, you know there's no point in me going through the whole thing. But if I convert everything to something you don't like to eat or I convert it all into stuff you do like to eat. It can have the same mass of food, same amount of food, but the amount of food you're going to eat is going to be very different depending on what form the food is in. So if all I throw at you is food you can't eat, then any smell from the other direction is going to be powerful, where, you know, the nature of repulsion. Um, and um, the inverse would be true. So it just has to do with the sensitivity which one affects you more um, and that would be the illusion of um, repulsion is really just the absence of a pressure again because you've converted the pressure into something you find uninteresting your matter finds uninteresting and here's a character who was around at the time of Einstein Sir Oliver Lodge was a British physicist and writer best known for his contributions to the development of wireless telegraphy. He perfected a radio wave detector and the heart of the early radio telegraph receiver. He was the first person to transmit a radio signal one year before Marconi did and received international recognition for his work. I, you know, it is kind of curious just because this guy does do some name dropping throughout this video, but he doesn't mention Tesla, which is kind of interesting. I, I, you know, I don't know enough about, I just, this smells like Tesla, and it just seems strange that Tesla is not mentioned in here. Lodge is also remembered for his work on the ether, which had been proposed as the wave-bearing medium filling space. There you go, wave-bearing medium. So this is where they make their mistake, is <coughs> they, <coughs> you know, just like Einstein's empty space, creating a medium without defining what this medium is made out of. Um, and again, how this medium, um, like, you, you can't, well, they try to, <laughs> but you can't account for the energy in the universe by just looking at the things that possess it, the matter, because the motion isn't 
being controlled just by that. The gravity is sort of free. You don't burn anything to create gravity. So you can't account for the motion in the universe if you just go with the matter and the energy in the matter because there's no loss of energy in the acceleration being created uh, by gravitational attraction. Neither body loses any energy in that process. So you have movement without any impetus, any force. And uh, so if you would say ether and understand the ether to be energetic ether, then you have something. So again, it's just a simple, you know, a simple change of the description. Go from an ether to an energetic ether um, that's car capable of carrying, you know, that you can <coughs> you can sail on. And I don't want, <coughs> I mean, it, it, it gets a little complicated, you know, the kinetics. But but the idea is is that it's not like light isn't sailing on the ether. Light is made of the same stuff as the ether, and it travels without any obstacle through it because it merely exchanges direction through it. And so it retains its frequency, it retains its period through it, even though it's a moving force, even though everything in front of it's moving, the frequency keeps going. The actual thing, the actual BBs are what changes, but what doesn't change is the direction of the initial BB. And of course, which the electric universe relies upon. Other I, I guess this is the thing I wanted to, you know, direction never changes. You can't get rid of it. You can't destroy the direction that exists in the vectors of the BBs. They can just exchange it, and by exchanging it, they can filter pockets of it and that's it. They can filter out of it more right than left. But they can't change the fact of where stuff is going. They're just changing what stuff is going left and what stuff is going right. Who possesses what's going right? You're always traveling on the ether, so to speak. You're, you're traveling on the force that exists. There's no... You're not making force. You're just traveling on force. And force can be um, it's almost like you're changing what how bound you are to it. You don't change the force, you just change what rail you're connected to. Like it is like streetcars with a bunch of cables running in different directions and you bite onto a cable and then you bite onto a different cable and you bite onto a different cable and depending on what cable you're bitten onto, that's which way you're going. Probably the better analogy. <clears throat> yeah, the school of fish works too, but I won't I won't do that in this video. Scientific work includes investigations on lightning, the source of the electromotive force in the voltaic cell or battery, electrolysis, the application of electricity to the dispersal of fog and smoke. He also invented electric spark ignition for the internal combustion engine. <laughs> well, I mean, that's sort of a... <laughs> well, I'm just saying, it's hard to call that one an invention. I mean, once you create spark and you understand it, hey, that can start a fire. Uh, the plug is like the nothing part. People man, rather like to Faraday, is prepared to experiment and try things. He was critical of the new theories of relativity proposed by Einstein. I would suggest that if education was done properly, his arguments against Einstein would be placed against Einstein's arguments and students allowed to judge for themselves. You know, well, I'll keep that in mind. Um, you know, if I can go find some Hodge writing and see what exactly those arguments are. I mean, I guess you should have, if you're going to post little comments and stuff, maybe you should have a couple of his anti-Einstein quotes there to be viewed. Maybe. Referring to Isaac Newton, he wrote, What is really wanted for a truly natural philosophy is a supplement to Newtonian mechanics expressed in terms of the medium which he suspected and sought after but could not attain and introducing the additional facts chiefly electrical okay well 
So that's their add-on is the chiefly electrical. I mean, the fact that Newton did consider Lesage gravity, he you know, was a fan of it for a while, um, and then had a fight with the, the guy who was in favor of it. Um, who knows what you know, transpired in you know, who knows, it's a soap opera of some kind. Um, but anyway, uh, but again, the, only, the, the reason why they couldn't make it work is because they didn't apply it in the world it exists in, which is a world where there is no friction and there's only, there's, there's no falling apart, there's no breaking into smaller bits, there's no, there's nothing that can happen. You can't possibly make energy. It's just that two things, one going this way and one going that way, they interact and the outcome is something's going this way and something's going that way, but it's not the same thing going that way. It's just a change in direction. The thing changes direction, but the outcome is exactly the same as if they never hit each other, which is really interesting. Especially the fact that variable inertia discovered since his time. That was in Nature. Trip well, uh, the fact of variable inertia. So again, that's there's 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 no variable inertia. There's no variable velocity. You either lose it or something um, imposes some other velocity on you. So you're either accelerated in an opposite direction or you give away your velocity to something else. But there's no variability, and there's certainly no variability in the quanta that make up the ether. Then, 1921. Lodge seemed to be fully aware that Newton's mechanics needed to take into account electrical effects on the masses involved. This is... Okay, Lodge seemed to fully be aware that Newton's mechanics needed to take into account the electrical effects of the masses of the particles. So, again, the electrical effects is... Um, it's sort of it's just saying uh, electrical is a kind of gravitational so I mean to tell Newton that he had to consider elect uh, you know gravitational effects on masses I think is incorrect is a pivotal idea for gravity well it is gravity it's just channeled gravity again it's the same mechanism photons are gravity um, electrons everything's made out of the same kinetic element. Understanding gravity is essential to be able to express mass in terms of weight in kilograms. Well, I think it's, again, see, see these, sorry, these people, they really don't get these E equals MC squared things in any kind of realistic sense, this electrical thing, because electric is just carried by these elemental atomic particles. So mass gives you a capacity to carry, um, carry, um, to create pathways or to block, as pointed out in a sense. But again, blocking isn't really blocking, so let me not create any confusion. When I say two bodies block gravity, they don't really block it, they absorb it in creating acceleration. They're absorbing the direction and that direction will eventually lead in some other direction, but it will leave. Um, it's never created or destroyed, it's stated. So all it can be is delayed, it can be um, suppressed um, in its mi 